Good morning, church family. Would you stand with us in worship?
your mercy that's new every morning Awaken my soul to see Awaken my soul to see family, guests, were gathered together to respond to God. Our first task is worship. There's fellowship moving towards each other. There's being shaped by the word and ways of God in scripture. But our first opportunity and invitation is to respond to worship. Worship rightly understood as a whole life response. It would be fair to say that every moment when we choose an obedience, to the Father in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, every point of obedience is an expression of worship. It's I'm living this way because of you, O oh God. I'm responding to who you are. So in moments like these, we gather and we praise. We speak the character and ways of God to melody, to lyric, 
And the Spirit of God ministers to us. Come Holy Spirit now, fall afresh on your people and awaken us to your goodness, glory, and grace. But as we respond today, I wanna use one of the primary places in Scripture that invite us in to respond. It's Romans 12, verse one. Paul having written this epic summation of God's way towards us in Jesus, he says this, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's multifaceted mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. For this, based on your translation, this is your spiritual act of worship, your reasonable act of worship. And isn't it interesting that the same Greek word could be translated either spiritual or reasonable. I often think we tend to think that spirituality is like we get whipped up into this sense of, oh God, when actually spirituality is deeply rooted in something that is also translated as reasonable. <laughs> in other words, in light of God being that merciful to us, in light of the cross of Jesus, in light of the fact that Jesus has fully and completely tended to our sin problem, in light of the fact that we have been fully reconciled with God and there's no condemnation, but instead we now are children, sons and daughters of the living God. Now that we are participating in a love from which we cannot be separated, now that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us, Romans 8, now that all of this is true, therefore in view of it, worship. And in your offering, give your whole being, your body, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. We're going to do that today in, in worship. We're gonna sing lyrics of, I am yours. I'm just totally and completely yours. And I am as such because you've been this merciful to me. This is, <laughs> I don't have a response, but this one. This one makes sense to me, I'm yours. I just love Jesus. I love being in his presence with you. So let's worship and please know that as we continue to sing, the prayer teams are ready to pray with you over anything that you would want to bring to them. Any burden you carry, they would gladly carry it to the Lord with you. So let's continue.
are the sheep of your pasture. You are our God. Be, give, be lifted high. Cross of 
your blood was shed for me There's no greater love than this You have overcome the grave Where it fills the highest place What can separate me
never fail Father, thank you so much for your kindness. Your grace has brought us here this far. And we know that this grace will lead us into the eternal rest in your presence. Precious Jesus, thank you so much for your blood that was shed for us on Calvary. You have made us righteous so we can boldly come before the throne of grace Holy Spirit renew our minds and hearts and guide us every moment of our lives to come into the presence of God in Jesus mighty name we pray Amen Morning Church family it was so good to worship with you and before we sit down, could we greet one another and make each other feel welcome? Good morning, church family. My name is Jen Bell, and I'm the missions director here at church. I'm excited to introduce you to a couple of missionary workers that we support monthly. They work in India, and they've been faithfully serving the lost there and reaching them for about 17 years now. They are in a place currently where they do have some financial need, so I would love for you to consider partnering with them monthly, or maybe just a one-time gift. 
We are so honored to partner with these people and I'm excited for you to learn more. Let's roll the film. Hello, Mill Creek Foursquare. We are Steve and Robin. We're so happy to have a chance to talk to you today. We first got connected with Mill Creek Foursquare back in 2007 when a short-term team came to India and it has been such a joy over the years since then. You've um, supported us personally and you've supported the work uh, that we're doing in India to see the lost uh, be gathered into God's kingdom. There are people in the world today who have never heard the story about Jesus. They have no opportunity to hear about Jesus. They are what we call unreached people, which means they will not be able to hear about Jesus unless someone crosses a boundary to get to them, a political boundary, geographical boundary, language, um, economic. Um, unless someone comes from the outside, they will never hear about Jesus. And you might think, there, how many of them can there be? Well, there's 3.4 billion people on the planet today, right now, even as we speak to you, who are unreached with the gospel of Jesus. It's tragic. Of the 3. Point, how many? 3.4 billion, <laughs> 1.4 live in India. 1.4 billion people in India who will not hear about Jesus unless someone comes from the outside to tell them about Jesus. So the task in India alone, 1.4 billion, is monumental, but it's not without hope. We've been focused on the unreached since 2001, mm -hmm. when we went to, first went to India, and then uh, we've lived in India and Malaysia now for a total of about 17 years. What we've learned, this task of reaching the unreached, is that we've got to focus on training nationals to be fruitful in the harvest fields, and then when they make disciples, train them to also make disciples, teaching multiplication. So Jesus' command in Matthew 28 is to make disciples of all nations. That's all people groups is really what that means. To do so, I have to stop trying to reach 1.4 billion on my own efforts. <laughs> That's addition. I reach one, next week I reach another, next week I reach another. We'll never get to 1.4 billion. But if I can make a disciple of a lost person and equip that person to immediately become my co-laborer in the harvest, so now we've got two laborers, multiplication happens very quickly. It's kind of incredible to watch as everyone I reach becomes a, could become a co-laborer and is equipped to become a co-laborer. And we've seen that happen in India. So in our first few years, we were not focused on disciple making, but in 2012, we switched our focus to do nothing but teach sheep to make other sheep. <laughs> um, we stopped focusing on pouring into shepherds. Shepherds don't make sheep. It's not like if we prop up the shepherds, they're going to be able to make sheep. Sheep make sheep biologically and sheep make sheep spiritually as well. So in 2012, we switched to this focus on empowering sheep to make new sheep. And that first year alone, we saw 60 Bible studies started in Hindu households. These are not Bible studies with Christians. These were lost families. These were Hindus. By the next year, most of those 60 Bible studies had become churches. Those Hindu families had taken baptism. They were now churches, and they were equipped to start new churches. And so they did. And so the sheep were making sheep. Since then, we've seen churches make churches, sheep make sheep. We've seen demon-possessed people freed. We've seen sick people healed. We lame walking. Generosity uh, um, explode. People just sharing freely, financially. We've seen the book of Acts come to life as the sheep have made sheep. So over the 12 years of this work, we think we've seen about 500,000 house churches birthed to this point, about 3 million, I'm certain more than 3 million baptized disciples of Jesus from Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh families. So Mill Creek, we're looking to double that number in the next year. And the majority of the work is done by our faithful brothers and sisters in India, but we do provide some outside help and we are looking for partners. So on the, on the screen, you'll see a QR code where you could donate today if you feel led. Please pray about that and do what the Lord tells you to do. Uh, what we prefer, prefer is the opportunity to meet you for coffee, take you out for a meal, and be able to share more about what God's doing in India and talk about what it really means to partner, that together we could help our Indian brothers and sisters see a lot more fruit, maybe even the fruit double in one year alone. And we think that's possible and that's how we're working and praying. We're thankful for the opportunity to meet with you today. Thanks for hearing us and considering. God bless. Bye-bye.
wonderful. They'd be here, but they're traveling at present in Asia. And so we recorded them to share that information with you. We regularly support the work of the gospel going to places that, that contain people who haven't heard the gospel message before. And when we say the gospel, what are we saying? We're saying the message that in Christ, God's reconciling the world to himself, that he wants to make sons and daughters of all tribes and nations, tongues and people groups. And so as we exist to make disciples, we know that there are many people globally who are doing the same thing on mission with Jesus. Steve and Robin are one of them. And so we give monthly to them as a church because you give, we as a whole give to them among many. We are committed to the work of sharing the gospel globally. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your support of Steve and Robin. But as you've heard, they are asking for the potential of your consideration of direct partnership with them. One of the things we're hearing from every one of our workers out in internationally is that costs have skyrocketed. And maybe you've noticed that. Your own, your own costs have skyrocketed, haven't they? Yeah, we have felt that inflation is a global dynamic and reality. And so those who are out on the field who are supported by those of us who are, are you know, showing up to work every morning, going home every evening, and giving of the resources that the Lord entrusts to us, they are just asking, by any chance, is the Spirit of God stirring you towards partnership? If so, Stephen and Robin would love to, when they're back in town, meet with you, or you can use that QR code, you can watch that video on our website. We're just inviting you to, towards that consideration. Love Stephen and Robin, love the mission of Jesus all the more and thank you for your consideration. All right, would, would you go ahead and please take your phone right now if you don't have it out already and go to mc4s.org on your web browser or open up our app as you may have that downloaded. And middle schoolers, would you go ahead and stand on up? Pastor Andrew is back there and he's ready for you. And while you're making your way on out to study, we're gonna do the same thing in here. So mc4s.org on your web browser. The first thing that I wanna bring to your attention is that digital connect card, as it is useful to help us connect meaningfully in a way that is not able to happen here in a gathering like this. As wonderful as these gatherings are, they are not intended to be deep in terms of interpersonal connectedness, which is where discipleship in Jesus flourishes. So as you're brand new here, we'd love to connect with you to cause you to feel at home. We get that it's a little interesting to be in a brand new spot at church that you don't know how you'll be received. So thank you for being here. We hope you feel the presence of God. He loves you, Jesus loves you. And we hope our treatment of you communicates that. So welcome. And if you'd give us your information, I promise you won't be added to lists you don't want to be added to. You have my word on that. I would just love to reach your way tomorrow or Tuesday in an email and just say, thank you for being here. And if you'd like to have a conversation, boy, would I enjoy that as well. So thank you for filling that out. And for those of you who've been here for some time, know that you can opt into a lot of things from the all church email to serving on a Sunday to an outreach during the week and to water baptism. As you scroll down, there's a place for a prayer request. It is a joy and honor for us as a ministry team to believe God for and with you as you allow us to pray over your prayer requests. So thank you for filling all that out. Also, please note on the note of prayer that we believe in the power of prayer and we love to pray together. And one of the great disciplines of a growing disciple is praying with other people. So Wednesday night is, from, for the most part, prayer night here. Almost every Wednesday night, we have smaller groupings of people praying together. And we want to invite you into that. So please be looking at that on the website. Also, there's a digital giving link. And you can utilize that as part of our worship or response to God. Right? We give of what the scriptures call our first fruits, that we entrust them into the capable hands of God. And so thank you for your faithfulness in this. This is part of the way we respond to God and it allows us to continue to reach in the name of Jesus towards each other and externally to our community and world. So thank you for your faithfulness. And then uh, just know that as you're in the room, if you have a physical gift you'd like to give, there, there's boxes by each of the doors that you can drop that in. And then the events page is going to keep you invited into opportunities that are important for building community and growing as disciples of Jesus. 
So first thing I want to quickly point out to you on that is that this afternoon we have our intro to MC4 class. And for the many who would be newer among us, this is a great class for you. Some who are not new will attend this class because it's the first of two steps towards membership. So if you've never gone but been here for some time or you're brand new and you're like, I really want to figure out who these people are, we do this class. It's about two hours long. I teach it because we really feel like we need to tell you everything about us. So we tell you about our 32 years of life together as a congregation. We tell you about the global movement that we belong to, Foursquare. We tell you about our doctrinal beliefs and values and priorities. And we invite you to ask any questions you want to ask. We think you need to get the answers to your questions to determine if this is a place that you can put roots down into and grow as a follower of Jesus as we seek to do that together. So please come to the intro class this afternoon. We'd love to have you. And then next, I need you on your phone signing up for politics, God and politics. That's next weekend. We have a Saturday seminar. We've done these about twice a year now. And we have a learning opportunity this coming Saturday with Pastor Joe Whitwer. He has served a sizable and significant Foursquare church in Spokane for over 40 years. They've planted more churches than any other church I know in the Northwest region. There are few voices I respect as much as Pastor Joe's. And I've heard him on the subject of politics at least three times. It was last May that I heard him most recently on it. He did a workshop on politics. And afterwards, I made a beeline for him. I said, would you come to our church and talk about politics? And he's like, you honestly want me to come and talk about politics? I'm like, yes, we need help as the people of God, as people who are kingdom citizens. Our truest citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. How do we steward our civic responsibilities? How do we think about them and how do we steward them? And let's just admit that we've been more discipled by our culture than by the word of God in this respect. We need help in thinking about our stewardship on politics. And we will, with the help of the Holy Spirit, not repeat 16 and 20, at least in this house, as much as we have in previous years. We want to grow as the people of God around this. So Saturday, he'll be teaching on God and politics. And then Sunday morning, he'll be teaching on a different subject. I already have the notes. You will want to be here. They are good. And Joe's a, an excellent communicator. So please sign up. God and politics, there's a small fee, 10 bucks. We're serving you lunch. We're serving you various foods. We're just trying to cover some of those costs. So please go ahead and sign up. If, if the cost is an issue, just come anyway. Okay, please just get here. We need an accurate head count though, and that's why I'm begging you. What do I want you to do? Sign up. Sign up because we, we need to make sure we have food for you. All right. Lastly, two Sundays from now, May 5th, we will be dedicating the new portion of our facility unto the work of Jesus. It is going to be a wonderful Sunday. Each service will be cut down to an hour long and in between at 10.30 a.m., we will have a ribbon cutting ceremony. Special guests, our founding pastors, Bob and LaDonna Hasty will be here. Our boss, our district supervisor, Steve Mickle will be here. Other special guests will be here. Pastors Don and Sue Kane intend to be here. So we're very excited about this celebration and asking the Lord to infill all that space that we have debt-free, praise God, all that space with ministry. Ministry to each other and ministry to our greater community. So we're excited about that. And all that said, I need to shut up because I'm not preaching today. Pastor Mark has a superb teaching. I've already heard it once. He got no pressure but the first service applauded him when he was done. <laughs> so no pressure, Mark. <laughs> Their expectations are high. Hey, would you welcome with me, Pastor Mark? Good morning. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Now, this morning has been a strange morning. I mentioned it in first service, but I tend to go through my notes way too many times, just counting the page numbers to make sure all the page numbers are there. And every time I do it, I go, oh, this is fine. I don't need to do this so much. But there's that fear that one day a page will be missing. <laughs> Today was that day. 
thankfully, thankfully, I caught it before, before the service started. I was in my office, and so I just printed off the last page again. And then me being me, I started checking again during worship to make sure they were all there. And another one was gone. <laughs> and I'm not sure how I missed that the first time. So I, <laughs> I ran out those doors, ran over, reprinted it. And when my wife came, I mentioned something to her. I thought, what? what? Do you know what happens? How do... uh, my seven-month-old twin was kicking and kicking the pages of my sermon underneath the furniture. So thank you, Joey. <laughs> Joey. All right, well, today is our last day focusing on King David. The journey that we started, I checked, it was back on November 26th, is coming to a close. And we will be studying one of my favorite passages in the Bible, which is Psalm 139. So I've mentioned this, uh, I've mentioned this before on a Sunday morning, but about eight years ago, on an April morning, not unlike this one, something happened that I will, I will never forget. I woke up. That wasn't, that wasn't the thing. <laughs> I woke up. I had breakfast. I popped into my car and I drove to my college where I was going to play some intramural soccer. It was fun. My team was getting beaten horribly, but whatever. Uh, but as I was playing, something strange began to happen. Remember, I was running towards the goal. And I started feeling a little bit funny, maybe a little lightheaded. Darkness started creeping in from the periphery. So I knelt down, waited for things to calm down, thought, that's strange. I popped back up and decided I would play goalkeeper, which was the position that I grew up playing. I enjoyed it. Didn't have to run as much. So the game continued. I was playing goalkeeper. I'm pretty sure I gave up a lot of goals, but it's intramural, so it didn't, didn't count. It didn't matter. What did matter are the saves I made. And I made some great saves while playing goalkeeper. And there was one in particular that I will not forget. The ball was struck really well. I think it was from outside the 18. The thing was a laser. It was just knuckling, dipping towards me, and just reflexes. I just jumped up, tipped it over the bar, landed on my back. It was glorious. It was fun. Felt good, but the good feeling was rather short-lived because as I got back up, that strange feeling began to come back. Except this time, and things get a little fuzzy for me, but this time the darkness completely took over. I think I walked over to one of my teammates, said something along the lines of, I'm not feeling right or something feels weird, went down to one knee, and again, as I mentioned, didn't go away, and I collapsed unconscious. I stopped breathing and my heart was fizzling to a stop. And with it, frankly, my life was as well. I think my last words might have been, this can't be good. And then, poof. <laughs> wasn't wrong. When I regained consciousness, I was in the hospital several hours later and I was rather uncomfortable because I was wearing a hospital gown. Also, the shirt that I had been wearing had been cut off of me and was underneath me. Strange feeling. The other thing is that nobody seemed to really tell me what was going on. And in hindsight, I think that's because they didn't know what was going on. Eventually, though, we began to piece things together and I learned what had happened. And that is, I had suffered a cardiac arrest. So a cardiac arrest is an electrical problem with your heart. It has to do with the rhythms and the beating. <laughs> Science class. So, this is a good EKG. It is steady, it keeps beating, this keeps you alive. This down here is ventricular fibrillation, which is a lot of fun to say, and I recommend you say it a couple times when you're just wanting to say a fun thing. Uh, it is chaotic, and it, it kills you. It's lethal. Your heart cannot get you out of ventricular fibrillation. Guess which one I had. 
Why then was I alive? What had happened? It was my teammates. They saw me collapse. They jumped in, they checked my vital signs, saw that I wasn't breathing, saw that there was no clear evident pulse. So they be, instantly they began CPR. They even ran to a nearby building to grab an AED, ran all the way back, put it on me, and then waited for it to connect and then shock me. And eventually, eventually it did. If that cardiac arrest had occurred anywhere else, I don't think I'm standing here today. Over the next several days, the next several weeks, months, so on and so forth, I underwent so many tests, so many procedures, so many surgeries. They poked, they prodded, they zapped, they shocked. They did everything they could do to try and figure out what caused it. And they actually, to this day, they still don't know what it was that caused it that, that morning. Perhaps, however, the most difficult and the most uncomfortable aspect of the entire thing was the recovery. Turns out having a cardiac arrest actually isn't all that bad. You just pass out. <laughs> it's the recovery that's not a lot of fun. As my brain recovered from the lack of blood, the lack of oxygen, as my heart recovered from being shocked countless times, and as the surgery scars hardened and eventually healed, it was as if my mind was still haunted by the traumatic experience. And the doctor actually seemed to acknowledge this. I checked just the other day to see if it was still there, and it, it was. On my record, he put four letters, PTSD. And I had thought that I knew what PTSD was. I, no, I, I didn't. I knew it had to do with memories, but I did not know that PTSD causes a miserable, full-body, physiological response that is utterly impossible to ignore and that it can happen at, at any moment. The sound of an ambulance siren would cause an unbearable response in which my heart rate and my breathing spiked and adrenaline started coursing through my veins. And the last thing you want to experience after you've had a cardiac arrest is your heart rate spiking uncontrollably. I remember watching Survivor with my siblings, and I think somebody had a medical emergency of some sort, and they came in and they did CPR. I think they were doing chest compressions. I don't totally remember because I, <laughs> I had to leave the room. Didn't, didn't want to watch that. And I think the worst, perhaps the worst part of it all was later that summer, I had this horrible dream in which I was killed. And it's not, those aren't enjoyable dreams. But what was specifically bad about this one is it was as if my body had remembered all of the physiological responses from that moment, bottled them up, and then opened them right there in that dream. It was not comfortable. Thankfully, as years have passed, much of this has gone away, though every now and again, it's not particularly enjoyable to think through. Why am I bringing this up? As I recovered from that cardiac arrest, Psalm 139 essentially became a soothing balm over that traumatic experience. I returned to it over and over and over again because in it I found hope, I found confidence, and I found peace. So Psalm 139 is ascribed to David. And so as we read David's Psalms, it's important that we remember his life and his context. David's highs were very, very high. He defeated Goliath in front of all of Israel. He brought the ark, God's presence, to Jerusalem. And God made a covenant with him. David's lows were also very, very low. He was exiled several times. He involved himself in all sort of gross power politics. And both his life and his family were destroyed by sexual sin and murder. And yet through it all, what do we see? He constantly returns to the Lord, a man after God's heart. Psalm 139 is also just rich with theological concepts. It illustrates important truths about God's omniscience, his omnipresence, and his omnificence. 
In other words, it shows us that God knows everything, is everywhere, and is creator of everything. But the thing that's so great about Psalm 139 is unlike teachers and textbooks, or at least how teachers and textbooks tend to be sometimes, he does not talk theology with nebulous, abstract, boring concepts. As David worships God through this song, describing and responding to his character, he does so not by singing about God. He does so by singing to God. It is both intimate and incredibly personal. And so as we study this passage, which as we'll see can be divided into four different sections, What we see is that Psalm 139 intimately shows us truths about God, and then it illustrates our appropriate responses to those truths. So the first section of the psalm, verses 1 through 6, are about God's knowledge of us. In the short version, God knows everything. Psalm begins by reminding us of God's personal and intimate nature. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. So David's premise is very, very clear. Before we move towards God, he is already moving towards us. And he knows us. The rest of the psalm then builds on this statement. If verse 1 states what is true, these next several verses explain how that is true. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. It might be tempting to move quickly through this somewhat repetitive and poetic language, but look at what David is doing here. He is showing us the extent to which God knows us. That first part, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. What in life is done that is not done while either being down or being up? Not much. This is a similar phrase to coming in and going out. The point is, God knows everything that we do. You discern my thoughts from afar. If the first phrase addresses our actions, the second addresses thoughts. God not only sees and knows what we do, he also knows our thoughts and he knows our motivations. And then you search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. This phrase has the connotations of day and night. So whether in the light of day or the dark of night, God gets us. There's not a thing you can do, or to use the terminology of the psalm, there's not a way that you can be that God doesn't know about, see, and understand. And then finally, before word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. We already read that God understands our thoughts. And now we see that he fully knows and understands our words before we even speak. So God doesn't just know us and know our past and present because he's watching us. He also knows our future. So right away, in just the first four verses of the psalm, we see that God understands and knows everything there is to know about us. Our actions, our thoughts, our desires, and our words. Our pasts, our presents, and our futures. And then in verse 5, we get a rather curious phrase. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. As we read through the previous verses, I think it might be easy for us to, and I don't think we do this intentionally, but I think it's easy for us to almost view God as an impersonal information machine who is watching what we do so he can figure out what we've done that is wrong so we can then be punished and he can set everything right. (laughs) Some sort of godly version of he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. While God is definitely aware of our sin, and he does, in fact, discipline those he loves, according to Hebrews, we have to remember that our walk with God 
is about so much more than right and wrong. Our spirit-led walk of faith is not defined primarily by our doing, but by our being. Or to put it differently, we are not defined by what we do. We are defined by who, by who God says we are. And his knowledge of us runs so much deeper than our sin. And that's why I love verse 5. The verb hem here can refer to a, a siege, the military tactic of an army completely encircling a city, being aware of what goes in, what goes out, preventing things, so on and so forth. It can also mean a hedge, as in a hedge of protection. So what do we do with this? Well, to understand exactly what's being conveyed, we have to remember that next line, you lay your hand upon me. God's knowledge of us is not the impersonal knowledge of a machine. And it is not the, the, the tactical, utilitarian knowledge of an army just trying to make something happen. It is the personal and intimate knowledge of somebody who in his initiating love draws so near to us that he surrounds us. You can think of it almost like a hug. It is the personal and intimate knowledge of somebody who from grace and not from obligation puts his caring and loving hand upon us. God knows everything there is to know about us. And he knows everything that we will do before we even do it. And he still loves us. He concludes the section, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I don't think David is just being poetic here. I think this is the only natural response to such knowledge. Though we must, of course, love the Lord our God with our minds, we cannot know everything there is to know about God. He is the creator, we are the created. This was made particularly clear to me when I graduated with my master's in theology and I finished feeling like I knew less than when I started. The more we know about God and the greater the greater we perceive him to be, the more we realize what we don't know and how much greater he is. So we conclude this first section, we realize an important takeaway. God knows everything there is to know about you and he knows it better than you do. And yet despite the brokenness and sin that so pervades our lives, he still loves you and he still cares about you and he still places his hand upon you. And that is a very comforting thought, even if it is far too wonderful to understand. As we continue through the psalm, we then see a shift in focus. So verses one through six are about God's intimate knowledge of us. Verses seven through 12 are about his presence with us. And similar to the first section, David begins with a statement that introduces the section, except this time he uses a question. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? It's worth, noting, <clears throat> it's worth noting that the word for presence here can also be used to mean face. And I like that because it reminds us just how personal God's presence is. We are not talking, when we talk about God's presence, we're not talking about something akin to the force in, the, in Star Wars. <laughs> Right? We're not talking about some sort of impersonal spirit that's just floating around out there that we can somehow tap into and harness and unleash. No. We are talking about a personal God who cares about us and is with us at every single moment of the day. David unpacks what that looks like in the following verses. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Isn't this beautiful language? Just, this is amazing poetic stuff. To really understand what David is saying, we have to dive into those metaphors for a moment. 
if I ascend to heaven, when David says heaven, he's using the term similarly to how we might use it up there. The heavens are whatever's up there and then farther up there. It is the highest high you can possibly go. So what he's saying is if I go all the way to the highest extent of the universe and maybe even more some, God is there. If I make my bed and Sheol, <laughs> to, to understand exactly what Sheol is and means, we would have to spend way too much time talking about ancient Israel's cosmology. And I really like my job. And so we're not going to do that today. <laughs> Simply put, don't think of Sheol as hell, as we might think of it. Instead, think of Sheol as representing death or the grave. It is the antithesis of the heavens. It's down there. Or it's lower than down there. So in other words, if I go to the highest highs or the lowest lows imaginable, God is with me. And then he does what I get really, really excited about, and I kind of geek out over this a little bit. He refers to the wings of the morning and the uttermost parts of the sea. When we read this, we should think of a sunrise, right? It sort of evokes that sort of imagery in our minds. Some, transla some translations actually say wings of the dawn, which I like. The sun crests over the horizon and the light spreads out like wings. Where does the sun rise? East. The east. The sun rises in the east. Sets in the, west. the uttermost parts of the sea for somebody in Israel. Where's the Mediterranean Sea from Israel? Sorry, I don't have a map for this. Hopefully we've looked at enough maps that we know this one by heart. <laughs> Where the uttermost parts of the sea would be? West. west. So whether I go to the highest highs, the lowest lows, the eastest east, or the westest wests, God is there. He essentially names every single direction possible. There's nowhere we can run from God's presence. But then he reminds us just how personal God is. His hand leads and holds us. So David is not just telling us that we can't outrun God. He's also showing us how God relates to us. Everywhere we go, God is actively in control, and he holds us safe. The section then ends with what I think is one of the more inspiring lines of the psalm. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. I think these two verses are particularly encouraging because they remind us that God is with us no matter how difficult the day may be. Tragedy strikes. Relationships are lost. The world is turned upside down. Everything is falling apart. Some of us may be experiencing that right now. In those moments, it can be so easy to wonder where God is. And it's understandable. This psalm reminds us that God is there. He is with us. He is for us. He's beside us. And though he may not change the circumstances of the situation as we would like, his light guides us through that darkness. Because as John 1 reminds us, no darkness can overcome the light of God. There's another important takeaway from the psalm. <clears throat> the future is a scary place. It just is. It's full of unknowns. The future is full of danger. It's full of heartbreak. And it's full of tragedy. And we will all experience those things. We can't escape that. I'm not trying to be a pessimist here. This is just life in a broken world. When we enter into those places, we do not have to invite God to catch up to us because he's already there. He's already there before us. And in fact, he's waiting for us in those moments. He's waiting to help us. 
He's waiting to shape us and he's waiting to strengthen our faith in him because he loves us and he does not leave us to fend for ourselves. And that's comforting. The psalm continues, David then praises God for his creativity. And he begins in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. The word used here for inward parts literally refers to the kidneys. Because obviously. This is actually kind of strange to us reading today. But a long, long time ago, uh, people actually thought that kidneys were the source of one's innermost feelings. Their emotions came from their kidneys. What David is saying here is that God creates all of what makes us us. It's not just the anatomical stuff. It is the emotional and it is the psychological stuff too. Before you were even born, God actively, God carefully And God intentionally pieced you together. All of what truly makes you, you, was created by God. The only natural response to such truth is worship. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Pastor and author Sam Albury notes that though God has by now made Billions and billions of people. We are not mass produced. We are not churned out in some mechanistic way. Each one of us is individually handcrafted by the God of the universe. The next several verses poetically illustrate God's creative and loving handicraft. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And then finally, this section ends with another blessed reminder that God is ultimately in control. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were for me, when as yet there was none of them. The truths found in this section of the psalm were particularly meaningful for me as I was recovering from that cardiac arrest. Because as I wrestled with the fact that I should have died, and I faced the reality that the doctors had no idea what had happened, I became deeply aware of the fact that not only did God make me, he knew everything that there was to know about me when he made me. And if we follow the logic, that means that when he made me, he knew that my heart would one day try to kill me. And he knew that the doctors wouldn't know what caused it. We live in a broken world, and God knows that we will experience pain and sickness. He knows that we will experience disease. Such is life as we await God's final restoration. But here's the thing. He knew my heart that would one day try to kill me, and he still made me. And not only did he make me, he made me carefully, he made me lovingly, and he made me wonderfully. This room is filled with countless health problems. This room is filled with health problems that we don't even know about yet. But what is true for me is also true for you. God knew that you would experience pain and suffering, and he still breathed his life into you. And despite whatever hardship you may experience, whatever hardship you will soon experience, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by the God of the universe who knows you, who loves you, who cares about you, and who works all things together for the good of those who love him. It's also worth noting here that this passage is frequently used to defend the lives of the unborn, and rightfully so. 
Because according to the psalm, while babies are still an unformed substance, God sees them and he knows their lives. He knows their stories. They are people. And to be sure, where such truths have been, have been ignored or whatever has happened, there's forgiveness and there's restoration in the blood of Jesus. I think it's also important to note, though, that an honest reading of Psalm 139 has to expand our vision of life. Because the pro-life message of these verses is not limited to the unborn. Whether in utero or on hospice, every single life is created by and overseen by the loving God of the universe. Because every single person who has ever walked on the face of the earth, every single person we could ever read about in a history book, and every single person we could ever see in any sort of social media is an individual who is personally known by God. And so as we read Psalm 139, let us allow the greatness and glory of God's wonderful and awe-inspiring character to expand our vision and expand our understanding of his creative and his active role in the world. Finally, the psalm ends by showing three appropriate responses to God's comprehensive knowledge, his presence, and his creative power. And the first one is appreciation. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. So right away, these verses show us two things. God's thoughts are precious and God's thoughts are many. As we dig deeper, though, we see again just how personal God is because the phrase, how precious to me are your thoughts, can also be translated, how precious are your thoughts about me, oh God. So this isn't just saying that God knows about us. This passage is saying that God thinks about us. God thinks about us so much so that it is impossible to count his thoughts about us, which means that the God of the universe thinks about us all the time. Just let that sink in. God thinks about you all the time. And that is not a statement about our own glory. (laughs) That's a statement about the glory of God. Our response has to be the same as David's appreciation. David's second response to God's character is different. And here we come to the sticky part of the psalm. Verses 19 through 22. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Cool. Thanks, David. One moment you're talking about how amazing God is, his knowledge, his presence, his creativity, and the next you're talking about killing the bad guys. How do we go from one thing to the other? What happened? There's a whole theology of the imprecatory psalms, psalms that seem to invoke curses on the enemies of God. And these four verses are imprecatory in nature. And when we read these psalms, they are uncomfortable. And because they're uncomfortable, we have this temptation to just kind of carefully tiptoe around them without making too much eye contact, lest we actually have to think about them. The problem is, These verses are just as inspired by the Holy Spirit as everything else we've read. So what is happening here? At the heart of these four verses is a genuine thirst for God's divine and intervening justice. He explains how these people are enemies of God. They're wicked. They're men of blood. They speak maliciously against him. They take his name in vain. And so with that context, he then distances himself from them and then emphasizes his own loyalty to God. In other words, I am not one of them. Please take care of them. If they're an enemy of you, they're an enemy of me. 
So what we see is that this is a call for justice, and David is responding to God's character as expressed through this psalm by expressing his desire for God to set things right. He's expressing his desire for God's justice to set things as they ought to be. And it's important to note that this justice is not the opposite of God's loving knowledge, presence, and creativity. This justice flows from his loving knowledge, his presence, and his creativity. They have to go together. Finally, he ends by expressing total humility before the face of God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a prayer, and this is a plea. And it mirrors almost perfectly what he says at the beginning. Verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Verse 24, search me, O God, and know my heart. In other words, do it again. Please do it again. As we appreciate and hopefully all identify with that humble yearning for God's divine intervention, we observe an important point. I don't think it's pure coincidence that this expression of humility comes right after David's call for justice. After he pleads for God to slay the wicked, he then humbly asks God to search him and find any wickedness in him. And recall David's life. There was a lot of wickedness in David's life. He knows a thing or two or 10 about his need for God's intervention in his own life. He knows the need for the Lord's purifying and refining fire. And so he pleads that the Lord would search him again, that he would investigate his thoughts, his words, his actions, his motivations, because he knows that on his own power, he can't do it. He needs the Lord. And then the last words of the psalm focus on the future. It is God who leads us into a glorious and everlasting future, not ourselves. And so David ends his psalm with these three responses to God's character. Appreciation, genuine thirst for justice, and humility. And may these responses be ours as well. May we all appreciate God for who he is. And may may we forever be stunned and amazed by the God that we cannot ever fully understand. May we all identify with and thirst for his justice, not as the world would have it, but as the Lord decides. And may we all humbly acknowledge our own sin, our own failures, and ask daily for the Lord to purify us. Isn't this psalm great? David calls out to God. He says, you know, there, you know everything there is to know about me. You are everywhere. You have created everything. And because of those truths, I appreciate you. I desire for you to make things right. And I humbly submit to you. Let us allow the truths of this psalm to penetrate in so deeply into the very core of who we are. Because it is one thing to know these truths in our mind. It's one thing to read this psalm and go, yeah, that's true, that's nice. It's a whole other thing to actually let those truths shape us at the core and believe them with all our heart. That's what I was grappling with this week. I know this is true. How does it affect me? And then lastly, it's important to reflect on the simple fact that Psalm 139 poetically illustrates the gospel centuries before Jesus was even born. And what is that gospel? Despite our sin and despite our brokenness, our loving creator God still knows us, he still cares about us, and he is still with us. And in love, he moves towards us before we can even think about moving towards him. This is, of course, most exemplified 
at the cross. And because of these truths, there is now nothing we have done, there's nothing we are doing, and there's nothing we can ever do that cannot be washed away by the loving blood of Christ. And though such knowledge is far too wonderful for us to ever fully understand, the lives in this room are living testimonies to the fact that it is true. Father, you are so, so good. You know everything there is to know about us. You are with us wherever we may go, and you've created everything, and you are still creating things. Lord, we thank you that you show us such truths through a beautiful psalm such as this one. And that in this artistic imagery, we find these truths affecting the very core of who we are. Let these truths not just sit in our minds, let them shape us in our hearts. I ask that you would search us. I ask that you would know our hearts. I ask that you would try our thoughts. I ask that you would find any wicked, any grievous way that may be in us and lead us in the way everlasting. We love you and we desperately need you. Please use us for your glory. In your son's name we pray, amen. It's been a pleasure being with you all this morning. If you would like prayer, we'll have prayer teams in the back. They would eagerly love to pray with you. And then if you are new, we'd love for you to stop by the info booth right out those doors. We have a gift for you. As we conclude, I ask that you please stand as I read a benediction from Psalm 139. May the Lord search you and know you. May he try you and know your thoughts. And may the Lord see if there be any grievous way in you. And may he lead you in the way everlasting. And may you experience this week his loving kindness, even if you can't fully understand it. Amen.